This is the Ford Theater, an hour of radio drama. Today's play, Ellery Queen's The Adventure of the Bad Boy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Howard Lindsay speaking. Welcome to the Ford Theater, which begins today its second calendar year. During 1948, if you care to join us here each Sunday afternoon, you will encounter at this hour just about every sort of dramatic entertainment possible to radio. In the Ford Theater, the play's the thing. And in choosing plays, the management aims at quality, contrast, and variety. Last week, an original radio comedy. Next week, a great motion picture adapted for radio. And this week, mystery. This week, the Ford Theater presents The Adventure of the Bad Boy by Ellery Queen. Now, there's a man I've always envied, Ellery Queen... He gets around so much, meets so many different kinds of interesting people, alive and dead. In the last few years, on paper and on the air, Ellery must have averaged one mysterious murder case per week, each neatly solved in the end with the culprit delivered over to justice. And not only does young Mr. Queen solve the mystery, he writes the story, too, between calls for help from the homicide squad. Also, of late, he's found time to edit an excellent magazine for tech story fans, to pen learned dissertations on the gentle art of mystery fiction, and to publish, just last month, an anthology of choice crime tales. He's a versatile man, Ellery, and a busy one. He is also, by this time, a legendary hero, an American Sherlock Holmes, with thousands of worshipful followers. We know that he's the son of gruff, steely-eyed, snuff-using Inspector Richard Queen, who can always be reached at police headquarters on Center Street, Manhattan. And we know that he employs as his secretary the beautiful, worshipful, long-suffering Nicky, who even now is typing up a forthcoming chapter in the multitudinous works of Ellery Queen. Meanwhile, Ellery relaxes in an armchair, deep in thought. Because, Mr. Figerson, nature is maddeningly logical, said Ellery Queen. A bird flies, the sun rises, a river flows, and a wound bleeds. Underline, and a wound bleeds. End of chapter. Ellery. Ellery, where are you? In the armchair, Nikki. I'm finished. Lucky girl. Are you kidding? Huh? Well, all you have to do is dictate these foul mystery masterpieces of yours. I have to type them, remember? I said, remember? What, Nikki? Oh, skip it. You haven't actually seen me for years, now you don't even hear me. Nikki, I'm sorry. Think nothing of it. After all, who am I? Birth of the typing machine, girl. Even in the sweatshop, the boss made a pass once in a while. (laughs) I'm sorry, Nicky, but I've been deep in thought. Really? About a little boy, Nicky. About a what? A little boy. Why, Ellery. Yes, it's time I did something about that situation. You're the screwiest character, Ellery. You would find a different way to do it. Do what? Oh, now we're being coy again. Most men would start the other way around. With the little boy's mother. Very nice woman, I'm told. Why, thank you. Coming from you, Ellery, that's a lavish compliment. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Oh, you don't have to think about it, Nikki. It's really my problem. Are you egotist? Well, I I didn't think you'd be interested. Ellery, why do you think I've held on to this thankless, frustrating job all these years? Interested? The first thing we'll have to do is tell your father. Dad? Oh, no, Nicky, not quite yet. Not yet? 
Well, why keep it a secret from the inspector? Because I'm not familiar with all the facts, Nikki. Facts? Yes, it might not even be a matter for the police at all. Police? Yes, I'll know more about it as soon as Dr. Melton gets here, which, uh, incidentally, ought to be any minute now. But, but Elry, Nikki, you... would you clear away all this truck? Of course, if you want to sit down and on it, I'll be very glad to have you make notes. Ellery Queen, exactly what little boy were you talking about? Hmm? Bobby Hayes. Bobby Hayes, hmm? And the nice woman? Bobby's mother, of course. Frances Hayes. I see. You fiend! Why, why, Nicky, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. No, don't you dare come near me. I, I don't seem to follow this at all. Oh, oh, of course. You don't know a thing about this case, do you? And here I've been talking as if you knew all about it. <laughs> yes. Ha, ha, ha. Well, you just sit right down here by the fire, and I'll tell you the whole story. That is, if you'd like to hear it, Nikki. Oh, I'm simply fascinated. <laughs> well, well, to begin with, I first got to know about it when Dr. Melton phoned me. And he got the story from the principals. His landlady, Sarah Brink, a spinster who owns a small apartment house in Greenwich Village. And Sarah Brink's unfortunate sister, Frances. Frances Hayes. Mrs. Hayes and her little boy, Bobby, who's eight, live with Sarah Brink. I, uh, I think it was four nights ago that it began. Yes, Auntie, what is it? Bobby? Bobby Brink. My name is not Bobby Brink. Well, it is in this house. It is not, Aunt Sarah. It's Bobby Hayes. Bobby, how dare you take that tone with me? It is so, Hayes. That's my father's name. That's Mommy's name. So it's my name, too. I know my own name, I guess. Your father's a bad man, Bobby. He ran away. Left you and your mother alone. He did not. Mommy says he's dead. Well, it'd be a mercy if he were. At least you and your mother would have his insurance. Insurance? What's that, Aunt Sarah? Never you mind. Bobby. Bobby, put the funnies down for a minute. Do I have to? Uh, Bobby, dear, don't you feel just a little bit grateful to Aunt Sarah? Huh? When Auntie takes her sister into her home and her sister's little boy gives them nice soft beds to sleep in and good things to eat, even money to spend. Don't you think the little boy ought to sort of, uh, well, love his auntie? Oh, I don't get so much money to spend. Oh, you're a wicked, ungrateful boy. What have you been up to in here while I've been making supper in the kitchen? Answer me, Bobby. Some mischief, I'll bet. I'm not doing nothing. I'm just reading the funnies. Chasing the cat, most likely. I was not. I've been reading the radio page. Oh, You miss all those nice programs since your mother's radio got broken, accidentally. Don't you, Bobby, dear? Aunt Sarah, couldn't we have it fixed? I gotta ask the fellows all the time what's happening to Superman. Fix it? Now, Bobby, listen to me. How would you like Aunt Sarah to buy you a nice new radio? Maybe a television set. Just for you. Gee, Aunt Sarah, would you? Why? Well... Maybe, if you gave me a real big kiss once in a while, Bobby. Who's there? Francis, is that you? Yes, Sarah. Oh, Bobby, son. Hi, Mom. Wow. Oh, Superman, that's oh. some hug. <laughs> ah, darling, what did you do today, huh? Oh, something wrong, Sarah? Yes, he was a bad boy, Francis, as usual. I declare, I don't see why ah, you don't... you're always snitching. Bobby... Mom, I played with the fellas in the park and a cop chased us just because we were climbing an old tree. You might have fallen, dear. And that's not all. Yeah, yeah. Snitch some more, Aunt Sarah. I threw a rock, Mom. Oh, Bobby, you did. I oh, just a little hunk of rock. Couldn't have hurt nobody. And it just happened to break a window. There, Francis. Are you satisfied now? Oh, that was wrong, Bobby. And I've told you so many times, you mustn't talk to your Aunt Sarah this way. <laughs> 
If you'd stay home and take care of your child, Francis, instead of prancing round all day. I wasn't prancing, Sarah. I was walking my legs off looking for a job. Oh, you and your jobs. Your first duty is to your child. You know you don't have to have a job, Francis, as long as you live with me. Yes, Sarah. I know. Coming home at all hours. Supper's ruined. It is. It is my stew. It's burning. <coughs> Just in time. I don't want your old stew. I don't like stew. Bobby, why, Bobby, you're not having stew. What would you say to a nice raspberry jelly omelette? Jelly omelette? Wow. Well, just as soon as I set these two plates of stew down, I'll fix your omelette, Bobby. Francis, hurry, will you? <gasps> For pity's sake, Bobby, now you stop playing with that canary's cage. Oh, Bobby, didn't hear what Aunt Sarah said. Now stop it. Oh, okay, Mom. And can I have prune juice too, Aunt Sarah? Why, certainly you may, Bobby dear. Bobby, bring now see what you've gone and done, leaving the canary's cage open. Oh, Bobby, there goes the canary. Sarah, catch it. Oh, of all the spoiled, misbehaving brats. If, if we could only... There he is, Francis. Catch him. Oh, catch I him. got him. <gasps> no. Oh, dear. Oh, now he's flown up on the chandelier. Oh, Bobby. Come I... down here. Drag your Sarah, dumb. shut the dining room door. He'll fly out. Shut the door, Francis. Yes, Sarah. Look out, the cat. Columbus. Columbus. Stop that, you bad cat. You. Sarah. Sarah. Oh, I think I could... Got him! Well, it's about time. You naughty canary. Back you go. <sighs> there. Are you... Are you quite finished, Francis? Well, now, Bobby Brink, suppose you tell me why you opened that canary's cage and why you've been sitting at the supper table and haven't so much as lifted a finger to help catch him. I don't care. I was just playing with the old bird. He flew past me, the dirty old bird. Bobby Hayes, what's come over you? Bobby, come here. What? Son, you've always been so kind to Aunt Sarah's pets. But now you chase Columbus, torment the canary, go fishing in the goldfish bowl. Do you like tormenting animals and birds and fish? Oh, Mom, I didn't hurt him. Well, I suppose that lets him off. Kindness, reasonableness. Trouble is, Francis, you don't discipline him. If he were mine, But he I... isn't, Sarah. Some will talk about this after supper. Yes, ma'am. <sighs> well, eat your stew, Francis. Yes, sir. I suppose I might as well eat mine, too, even if it is icy cold by now. Well... Well, what's the matter, Francis? Isn't my stew good enough for you? Bobby's omelette, Sarah. You've forgotten. Oh, have I? Bobby, I'll make it for Sit you. Sit down. Sarah, please. I've told you a thousand times, Francis. I won't have you or anybody else messing in my kitchen. Bobby will wait for his supper since he's spoiled ours. Well, Sarah, the stew can be reheated. As if my gas bills aren't high enough as it is. He'll wait. Bobby, I won't eat oh, until... Oh, go ahead, Mom. I can wait. I'm not hungry anyway. Thank you, son. Every time we sit down to eat, that awful fiddling starts. I declare that foreigner does it on purpose just to annoy me. That's only Mr. Weber downstairs, Aunt Sarah. He likes to play that song. Bobby. Oh, I, I must have been insane when I rented that apartment to him. Fiddler I'll have him evicted. That's what I'll do. I'll have him thrown right out into the street. Him and his nasty fiddle. Well, don't stop there, Ellery. What happened then? Then, Nicky, they finished their supper. Sarah Brink made Bobby a jelly omelet, which he devoured with great relish, while his mother began to clear the table. Bobby, uh, the stew is delicious, Sarah. Bobby, you may leave the table. But, Mommy, why can't I have a piece of apple pie? I'm especially hungry for a piece of apple pie. I've already told you, Bobby, if your mother won't punish you, I will. You just mean me. Oh, I am, am I? Bobby, please, I told you to leave the table. Oh, okay. Mom, may I go down? 
downstairs and see Mr. Gordini, I promise. You certainly may not. Sarah, aren't you forgetting that I'm Bobby's mother? I've told you and told you, Francis. Letting a young child spend all of his time with that, that worthless, greasy actor. He's as nice as anyone you know, Sarah. Bobby, you may visit Mr. Gordini for a half an hour, then come upstairs to bed. Gee, thanks, Mom. Bobby, wait. Bobby, I forbid you. I forbid you. Do you understand? You are not to go downstairs. And Francis, just as long as you live in my home on my money, you'll do as I say. Is that clear? I can't stand this anymore. Always throwing up to me how dependent I am on your charity. Trying to run my life, my child. Because we have no other place to live. So I'm going to leave. I'd rather stop. Oh, stop that <laughs> silly crying, Francis. If you'd listened to me, you wouldn't have been deserted by that no good husband of yours and left penniless to support a child. I was good enough to take you in, and I'm good enough to dictate what's best for you. No, I'll take Bobby and get out of well, here. Well, if you want to live in the street, I suppose you're of age, but you're supposed to love this child. What are you going to feed him on? Kisses? Mom? Mom? I, I don't want to see Mr. Gordini. It's okay. I... I'll go right to bed, Mommy. It's all right, Bobby. You may go downstairs. Please, Bobby. Go on now, dear. No. He's staying here. Bobby Brink, if you set foot outside this apartment, I... Oh, Sarah. Oh, I Francis, I... I feel so funny. Sarah, what's the matter? I... Mommy, I Sarah fell down. Sarah, my... My throat. Stomach. Hot oh, fire. Good breeze. Bobby, run downstairs for Dr. Melton. Quick! Attempted poisoning. I'm afraid so, Nikki. Curious case. Not that I condone it, but it seems understandable. What an old bat. She owns the house, huh? Yes, one of those old three-story brownstones facing Washington Square Park. She's converted it into a four-family apartment house. The Brinks apartment's on the top floor... Dr. Melton lives on the ground floor. And the intermediate floor is occupied by two tenants. Weber, a refugee who teaches the violin. And Gordini, who seems to be an actor. But, Ellery, they can't possibly have anything to do with it. Oh, that's Dr. Melton. I'll go. Yes? I'm Dr. Melton, and this is Miss Sarah Brink. Come in, Doctor. Dr. Melton and Miss Sarah Brink, Ellery. Well, uh, how do you do? Evening. Miss Brink's the patient I phoned to you about, Mr. Queen. Easy now, Miss Brink, please. Here's a chair. Thank you. Sit down, Dr. Melton. Oh, this is my secretary, Miss Porter. How do you do, Miss Porter? How do you do? I must say, I'm a little surprised, Doctor, to see Miss Brink with you. She's still pretty shaky, but I thought we'd risk it, Mr. Queen, even though it's only a four days since... The accident. The accident. Now, don't excite yourself, I please. I told Ms. you, Dr. Melton, it was some sort of accident. Oh, I don't know why I've let you bring me here. A detective. Miss Brink... It couldn't have been an accident. Oh, dear. What do you suspect, Doctor? I don't suspect. I know. Miss Brink was poisoned. By accident. You're asserting that not as a theory, Doctor, but as a fact. Judge for yourself. I know you've had some experience with these things, Mr. Queen. Yes? Miss Brink ate on an empty stomach. About ten minutes later, she fell writhing to the floor. Symptoms? Burning pain in throat and stomach. Intense thirst. Collapse. Cyanosed skin. Difficult respiration, cramps in the calves of the legs. Arsenical poisoning. Yes. How awful. I suppose you had the remains of Miss Brink's portion of stew analyzed, Dr. Melton. Of course. It was heavily dosed with arsenic. Miss Brink, who are your heirs? My, my heirs? Yes. Well, my sister Frances. She's my only living relative. Your sister and her little boy, you mean. He's your nephew, isn't he, Miss Brink? Yes, Comfortably fixed, are you? Well, I... I own my own house. Have a few thousand dollars. Any domestic help? I... I do my own housework and cooking. Can't afford servants. Hmm, I see. Uh, Dr. Melton. Yes, Mr. Queen? I believe you said Mrs. Hayes, Miss Brink's sister, ate stew that evening and showed no ill effects. None at all. Well, obviously, then. Only the stew on your plate, Miss Brink, was poisoned. Was your sister in the kitchen at any time during the preparation or cooking of the stew? Why... Francis was away all day. She didn't get back till a few minutes before I fetched the two plates of stew from the kitchen and set them on the dining room table. Was your nephew in the kitchen while you were cooking? Bobby? Yes. Oh, no. No, not at any time. And after you set the plates down on the dining room table, Miss Brink, 
Did your sister have an opportunity to drop arsenic into your plate? I tell you, it was an accident. Did she? No, no. Just as I set the plates down, Bobby let the canary escape, and Francis and I began to chase it. I know that, Miss Brink. I just wanted to be sure. Uh, by the way, what was your nephew doing while you and Mrs. Hayes were chasing the canary? Bobby, why... Why, uh, Bobby was seated at the table. Alone, alone and unobserved. No, I mean, uh, yes, yes, he was, uh, but... Miss Brink, Miss oh, Brink, please, dear, please. That's horrid, Ellery. Facts very often are, Nicky. Dr. Milton, take me home. Miss Brink, you can't let this drop. I won't have another word said about the entire matter, understand? You may have no choice, Miss Brink. This is attempted murder. It's not. It's not. Anyway, if you interfere, Mr. Queen, I, I'll deny everything. Yes. And you needn't try to send me a bill. I I won't pay it. Well, Mr. Queen, I, I didn't realize who was involved. I mean, I think you ought to know, though, that she's concealing her real financial status. She owns half a dozen buildings in Greenwich Village. And she's one of the wealthiest women in the neighborhood. I'm sure of that, Dr. Melton. Well, I'd, I'd better get her back home. She's still pretty weak, you know. And at her age, it, it was a narrow escape. I'm sorry. It's all right, Doctor. Goodbye. 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 Ellery, isn't there something you can do? Yeah, if she denies the story and refuses to press charges, Nicky, I'm afraid not. But I just can't believe it. it it's frightening. An eight-year-old boy, Ellery. Yes. Apparently, the boy released the canary deliberately to lure his mother and aunt away from the table so that he could poison his aunt's stew, unobserved. I don't care how much of an old witch Sarah Brink is. To do a thing like that, a boy of eight, he must be a fiend, Ellery. Psychopathic case. Well, something ought to be done about it. The woman's in danger. That's quite true, Nicky. Unsuccessful poisoners usually repeat. Nikki, what uh, what kind of stew did Sarah Brink say she cooked that night? Kind of stew? Yes. I don't know, Ellery. I don't think she said. No, careless of me. I should have asked her. Well, about all we can do, Nikki, is to try to interest some social service agency and hope for the best. Hand me the phone, will you? <laughs> But it wasn't to be. Everything was closed for the New Year's weekend. And then, it was just yesterday afternoon. Ellery Queen's residence. Naturally. Hello, Nicky. Oh, Inspector Queen. Nicky, put Ellery on. Right. Ellery. Yes? Your father. Oh. Yes, Dad. Son, you'd never forgive me if I didn't let you in on this. You know what, Dad? Not kind of case I ever saw. Can you get down here in 15 minutes? I'll try and hold them. Hold them? Hold whom? Witnesses to the crime. About three dozen of them. Three dozen what? In fact, if you don't hurry, there'll probably be 300 of them. Dad, I don't see what... Washington Square North. Make it snappy, Harry. 36B Washington Square North. What are you mumbling about, Ellery? What did the inspector want? Nikki. Nikki, that's the address of Dr. Milton's poison case. Sarah Brink? Yes. And Dad says there's been another crime. Come on. Three dozen witnesses. And Inspector Queen, usually the coolest cop between the Battery and the Bronx, is in a state of considerable excitement. We'll meet the witnesses and Queen the Elder in Act Two along with Sergeant Veely and a quorum of suspects. Act two of The Adventure of the Bad Boy will be presented after a brief pause for station identification. Theater, The Adventure of the Bad Boy, Act Two. Our intermission turned out to be just long enough for Ellery Queen and Nikki 
to hail a cab, hop into same, and head for 36B Washington Square North, the scene of the crime. We pick them up as they swing around the lower Fifth Avenue corner of Washington Square. Hop it, Nikki. Come on. Gentlemen, wait for ladies. Excuse me, please. Mind letting us through? Oh, you might carry me. Pardon me. Officer. Huh? Hello, Mr. Freed. Here, one side, you people. Stand back there. Stand back. Here. You still with me, Nikki? It's not your fault if I am. Hillary, you don't think there's been another... I'm trying not to. Come in, my son. Come in. Oh, Billy, it's about time. Well, you all set for a little surprise? What's happened here, Sergeant Beatty? Uh Uh-huh. Right this way, folks. Inspector's waiting for you. Beely, what's all the mystery about? I got my orders, Maestro, you'll say. A surprise, you said, Sergeant? I'll say it's a surprise. One more flight. Huh, the drink apartment. That is correct. Hey, you know the old dame, Maestro? That Henry, Beely? Yes, sir. Dead. Hello, Nicky. Hello, Inspector. Well, you see this, son. You won't believe it. Try me. Inspector? This way, please. This is the upper hall, Ellery. Doors off here all lead to various rooms of the apartment. It occupies the whole floor. Here we are. You men ready? Yeah. Really? Flint? Yes, we do. Take it, Hagstrom. Yes, sir. We do a repeat, huh? Oh, but Inspector Queen, we don't have to go through all that again. You think once a day enough, Flint. I'm not mad. They are, all of them. Dad, will you please... It's a joke, isn't it, Inspector? Some joke. All right, boys. Take your positions just outside the door. Henry, right, this is exactly what we found when we got here and opened this door. Yes? Open it, Bailey. Now, remember, fellas, this is all for dear old NYU. 2-14-89. Hep! There's one getting away. That one, you fine. Come here, you little devil. Rabbits! Rabbits! Rabbits, yes, rabbits. Herds of them. Spent half an hour chasing through the house trying to recapture that dad blasted bunnies. They all came out of this bedroom, Avery. Whose room is it, Dad? A woman named Sarah Brink. Owner of this house. Sarah Brink? No, Nikki. Stay in the hall. Yep, son. That's just what we found when the rabbit scooted past us. What? Sarah Brink, Nikki. Dead. In the appearance of these bedclothes, Doc, looks like there was a struggle. Sure there was a struggle, Inspector, with old man Death. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, you'd struggle too if you'd die to what she did. Now, uh, let's see. Well, what was it, you cadaver mechanic? No, no, Dick, your blood pressure... Say, this is a fine time for a fiddle to be scratching. Yeah, who's that? Some fiddle teacher that lives downstairs named uh, Weber. Well? Well, Patty? That's no use, Inspector. The family lunched on rabbit stew today, hmm? Yes, and right after lunch, the old girl came in here to lie down for a nap. Had some vittles in her stomach, I'll bet, before she ate that stew... Otherwise, you'd have passed out a table. Well, gentlemen, it's arsenical poisoning. Ah. Well, if it ain't the maestro. I was beginning to think we weren't speaking, Henry. Yes, sir. Arsenical poison. You're positive, Dr. Prouty? Sunken features, cyanose skin, irritation of eyelids, and skin eruption. There can't possibly be a mistake. Doubt, my boy, is the deity of science. But in this case, I'd stake my professional reputation it was arsenious oxide. White arsenic. Better do an autopsy right away, Prouty. Make sure. Naturally. Runch's test will do the trick. Yeah, she'd have been luckier if she'd been born a rabbit. Arsenic won't kill them. They're immune. Okay, call the wagon. On the way, Doc. And uh, here's your removal order. What's this? That's what, son? This top hat on Sarah Brink's night table, Dad. Oh, 
You've spotted it, Avery. Where was she, a male impersonator? Uh, interesting, huh, Maestro? Well, well, I'll be. Observe. I have nothing up my sleeve. I insert my right hand in the hat. Hocus pocus, open sesame, till Erlen Spiegel, presto. A rabbit. Very interesting. <laughs> so what? Oh, uh, merely one bunny too scared to run away when you boys opened the door, Sergeant. Took refuge in this silk tupper. Top hat and rabbits. <laughs> the murder must have been committed by a magician. <laughs> <laughs> what I tell you, Veli? Maestro, you throw me. You throw me. Walk over that buck. Oh, here, Inspector. <laughs> Didn't I tell you to say that, Veli? I bet you framed it. Oh, but, Dad, I wasn't serious. Well, I am. She was poisoned by a magician, all right. I've got him in the living room right now, you... under arrest. You mean there's actually a magician mixed up in this? Oh, of course. The actor. Uh-huh. Lives downstairs across the hall from Weber, the violin teacher. The vaudeville magician, Maestro. Calls himself Gordini the Great. Hmm. I want to see him. Lynn. Yeah, Inspector. Gordini been acting up? Nah, gentle as a rabbit. I don't mean to tell you how to run your business, Inspector, but believe me, I didn't poison Sarah Brink. I know, Gordini. You're just a victim of a plot. This is my son, Ellery. He wants to talk to you. Mr. Gordini, I'm very much interested in Sarah Brink's death. I'm told you were home today in your apartment at around noon when she was poisoned. That's right, Mr. Queen. I'm temporarily at liberty. You could have used your time to better advantage, Mike. Just a moment, Sergeant. I'm told, too, Mr. Gordini, that the fire escape makes it possible for you to have been just outside Sarah Brink's kitchen window while the two plates of rabbit stew which Miss Brink and her sister, Mrs. Hayes, ate for lunch today, stood on the serving cabinet near the kitchen window. Yes, Mr. Queen, but the kitchen window has an iron grill, which can only be opened from inside. All the windows at the back of this house have. How am I supposed to have got past those bars? With this thingamajig, Gordini. Uh, where'd you get my lazy tongs? Is that a lazy tongs? And when are they, Inspector? It's like a pair of scissors, really. Opens and shoots out in crisscrossing slats. Like this. Hush, hey, you... You missed my schnoz by half an inch. Well, I missed, didn't I? Be careful. You got the idea, Henry? Yes. This is part of Gardini's magic equipment. Comes from his stuff downstairs. Gardini, you stood on the fire escape outside the Brink kitchen window and dropped arsenic into Sarah's plate of stew from the end of these tongs through the grill. What can I do but deny it? It's not true. And a top hat. It has pockets inside, Gardini. A regular magician's hat. You admit it's yours? Of course it's mine. But you're innocent. How did it get into the Brink woman's bedroom? I don't know. Dead. Hold it, son. But then I've had you check this afternoon. Your real handle's Gordon, Algernon Gordon. And you were a chemist before you became a stage magician. Then you'd know all about arsenic. Wouldn't you, Mr. Gordon Gordini? I see I'm to be convicted on coincidence. It's no coincidence that you've been quarreling with the murdered woman, Gordini. The whole neighborhood knows about it. Quarreling about what? Well, it seems the old lady told him to keep away from her sister Frances and the kid Bobby. Oh, well, that's pretty circumstantial, Dad. Is it? And bat this around, Ellery. I've got a witness who lives in a McDougal Alley house opposite the back windows here. My witness says she saw Gordini standing on the fire escape outside Sarah Brink's kitchen window at just about the time that rabbit stew must have been poisoned. Is that true, Gordini? Yes, Mr. Queen. I was there, but I was, well, snoofing. Why? I'd, I'd rather not say. Pretty lame, Gordini. That's the best you can do. Dad, there's one fact you've overlooked that punches a pretty big hole in your Gordini theory. What's that, son? Frances Hayes had stew for lunch today, too, didn't she? Yes. She wasn't poisoned, was she? No. But both plates of stew, you say, the one which Sarah ate and the one which Frances ate, were on a serving cabinet near the kitchen window, accessible to Gordini on the fire escape through the lazy tongs. How could Gordini have known which plate was Sarah's? Yes, how could I have known? Maestro's got something there, Inspector. Yes. As for Gordini's top hat being in Sarah's bedroom, Bobby Hayes told me he brought it there this morning. Yes, yes, I'd forgotten that. That's quite possible. Bobby often plays with my paraphernalia. Furthermore, the rabbits aren't Gordini's. They were Sarah Brink's. She sometimes fed them in her room. Well, I think that pretty well explodes the circumstantial case against Gordini. Thank you, Mr. Queen. But I'm not through with you, Gordini. Yes, sir? You're obviously concealing something. What is it? I don't know what you mean. Gordini, I think you know who poisoned Sarah Brink. Do you? 
You do, don't you? No, talky. See if you can make Gordini change his mind, Dad. Where are you going? Oh, to snoop around. I knew something horrible would happen in this house. I knew it, I knew it. Oh, Mommy! Please, Mrs. Hayes, you've got to control yourself. Yes. Oh, son, it's all right. Don't be frightened, baby. Aunt Sarah's just gone away, Bobby. Oh, she's dead, Mom. Bobby. Who's that? It's probably an officer. Come in. Oh, Nikki. Ellery. Well? Glad you're with Mrs. Hayes, Nikki. Hi, Bobby. Hi. Miss Porter's been a great help, Mr. Queen. You are a real detective? <laughs> well, sometimes I wonder, Bobby. Mrs. Hayes, all the pets in this house, canary, cat, goldfish, they were your sister Sarah's, weren't they? And the rabbits, too, Mr. Queen. Oh, yes, the rabbits. I assume she didn't quarter them in her bedroom permanently. Where did she usually keep them, Mrs. Hayes? In the backyard. In a real rabbit hutch. That's so, Bobby? Yeah. Sarah... Mrs. Hayes, who fed them? Sarah wouldn't let anyone else take care of... You remembered something, Mrs. Hayes? Yes. Sarah had an argument last week with Mr. Webber. She caught him feeding her rabbits in the yard. Boy, did she tell him off. Webber. Must be Webber playing the violin now. Excuse me. Sergeant. Yeah, Maestro? Have Webber brought up, will you? Now, that's constructive. Anything to stop that fiddle. Oh, Mrs. Hayes, you had rabbit stew rather often, didn't you? At least once a week. Sarah is... was very fond of it. She killed her own rabbits. They were multiplying so rapidly. I don't like rabbit stew. Yeah, and Mom doesn't either. She only ate it because Aunt Sarah made her. Bobby, just after your sister brought the plates of stew into the dining room for lunch today, Mrs. Hayes, did, uh... did anything unusual happen? Unusual? Well, I, I don't think I... Well, like, uh... Like the escape of the canary last week. Well, you mustn't think Bobby's a bad boy, Mr. Queen. He's just mischievous, like most boys of his age, and he didn't then need to do anything. something did happen at lunch today. Ah, oh, you can tell him, Mom? I pushed over the fishbowl. Oh, Ellery. Sorry, Nikki. And while your mother and aunt were rescuing the goldfish, Bobby, what were you doing? Sitting at the table. Aunt Sarah was yelling at me. She said, just for that, I couldn't have chocolate cream pie. I'm glad she's dead, old yellow. Bobby, Bobby, you mustn't talk that way about... <gasps> yeah, well, come on. Well, yeah, Inspector, you. Sergeant. Dr. Melton and Herr Webber. What's this now, Henry? Oh, we've just been chewing the fat in here, Dad. Mr. Webber, you're the violinist we've been hearing all afternoon? Yeah. Mrs. Hayes, I'm terribly sorry about your schwester, Miss Brink. I hear what happens. If you're sorry, why have you been playing your violin? And my sister lying dead up here. Ah, but this is doch, how do you say, sad music, Mrs. Hayes. I have sad feelings. I play sad music. What I am from where I come, it is all sad. Everything. Everyone. Even here, I, I cannot forget. Mr. Weber, I understand you fed Sarah Brink's rabbits last week. Yeah, yeah. Mid lettuce. Hmm. And she was very angry with you. And so, I sit in the backyard thinking of Köln, Stuttgart. Sweet cow, I play my violin. I lay it on the bench, I feed the bunnies. Miss Brink, she comes out, she takes my violin, she breaks it in little pieces. She is like a crazy woman. That is my good violin. The other, the one I play now on, that is not so good. Well, Sarah had a, a vile temper. I'm sorry, Mr. Webber, I, I didn't know about that. <laughs> Natürlich. I want she shall pay for my instrument. I am poor. But she says no. I should move. Also, I move. Tomorrow. Herr Dr. Melton, he is moving also. Oh, really? That right, Dr. Melton? Yes, as soon as I can find new quarters in this neighborhood. Why are you moving, Doctor? Well, my patients are all pretty poor, Mr. Queen. They don't pay very well. I've been behind in my rent. The other day, Miss Brink said she wouldn't wait any longer, that, well, I'd have to get out. But Dr. Melton, I didn't know that either. I know, Mrs. Hayes. I suppose I own this house now. Well, you don't have to move. 
You've been here so long, Doctor. Why, that's... That's very decent of you, Mrs. Hayes. And you too, Mr. Weber. You stay on. And as soon as I can, I'll pay for your broken violin. Thank you, schön. Thank you, schön, thank you. Blast it. What, Dan? Ah, oh, this racket is one part luck and 99 parts waiting. Reports, reports. Where are they? Oh, Hi, Inspector. Uh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Kicking that cat. Here, puss, don't let the nasty old man hurt your feelings. Cats, goldfish, canaries, rabbits, regular zoo. Don't look at me that way, Nicky. I didn't kick the confounded beast. I didn't know he was there. There, he's apologized, puss. He's a nice, nasty old man. Harry, anyway, what's the answer to this blasted riddle? If Cordini didn't poison the stew... I've got a notion, Dad. Just the vaguest notion. Oh, the great man has a notion. Imagine that, puss. Suppose it'll ever grow up to be a great big idea. Hey, who swiped my gun? My penny? My gun, Inspector. My rod. Somebody left it right out of my holster. Was it one of you? Come on. Was it? <laughs> Why, Sergeant, I'm ashamed of you. You better find it, Bailey, before it turns up on the scene of a crime. It uh, wasn't one of you? No. I'll never hear the end of this. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. <laughs> Where's my handkerchief? That's funny. I'm sure it was in my bag. Your handkerchief missing, Nicky? No, Ellery, my compact. Why, it isn't here. What's this now? You'd better take a look at yourself, son. Oh. My fountain pen. It's gone. It... Hey! Why, it's not Bob. What? Inspector. Oh, Flint, what is it? Well, Doc Crowdy just phoned from the morgue. He said something about submucous hemorrhages showing up in the PM or something. Anyway, the old dame died of arsenic poisoning, he says. Well, that's progress. That we knew that. Oh. Well, uh, there's a report from the city toxicologist, too. You know that white stuff looked like flour we scraped up from the floor of the rabbit hutch? Dad, you found a white powder in the backyard rabbit hutch? Sure, son, before you got here. So what, Flint? Well, the toxicologist says that's arsenic, too. Arsenic in the rabbit hutch? Why didn't someone tell me? Hey, hey, Inspector! Huh? Oh, it's you again. Hey, I found my gun. You did, Sergeant? Where? On the downstairs hall table. My gun and your snuff box, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, give me that. Uh-huh. Thanks. You didn't find a compact by any chance, Sergeant? I sure did. Is this yours, Miss Porter? Well, thank you. And don't tell me, my sir, this fountain pen is yours. Yes, yes, Sergeant. Thanks. They were all on the downstairs hall table, huh? Uh-huh. Something awful funny around here. Someone swiped something from each one of us. Leaves them in plain sight to be found. A thief who returns his loot. That if he didn't want the stuff, why in time did he steal it in the first place? That's it. What is that? What, Ellery? The key to the whole case. Ellery, you mean the one who stole it? Yes, Nicky. The key to the whole case. The key to the whole case. Somewhere around this point, I believe, it used to be novelist Queen's practice to challenge the reader to name the culprit with all the pertinent facts at his disposal. My guess always goes wrong. And in this case, I suspect so is yours. Act three will, uh, shall we say, uh, let the cat out of the bag or uh, the rabbit out of the hat. And so you might just as well give up, stop guessing, and relax... This act ended, you will recall, Ellery Queen had just discovered the key to the whole case, to which, as our curtain rises once more, Nicky makes reply. You know, Ellery, you're the most exasperating man alive. You mislead people. Me, for instance. What, Nicky? Oh, I know you're not listening. You never do. You make people think things, then it turns out to be something entirely different. The inspector can't help himself. After all, he's your father. 
But someday I'm... What's this? What? This, Nikki. Oh, why do I always fall for it? An old closet. Key to the whole case. What key? No answer. The great man wraps himself in mystery. Hush, hush. Top secret. Ellery, will you come out of that closet and listen? You come into this closet and listen. Huh? Hear it, Nikki? It sounds hollow. Something funny about that wall. And this is Bobby's bedroom. Look. A sliding panel. <laughs> sort of medieval, isn't it, Ellery? No, Nikki. Simply eight-year-old boy. Bobby's sawn through the back wall of his closet. Let's see what's behind this panel. Secret passages yet. Here, give me that flash, Nikki. Flight of wooden stairs going Let's see where out. Where it goes? Hillary, you wretch, you've got the flash. Here, Nikki. Watch your step. Hillary, doesn't that violin of Weber sound louder? Uh-huh. This passage apparently acts as an amplifier. Hmm. Where it leads. A door. Just an old attic. Uh-huh. Oh, Bobby couldn't have built these stairs. Hardly. It's an old house, Nikki. Part of the original. The stairs were probably boarded up during some renovation, and Bobby's re- re- dis- rediscovered them. Ah, what's that? Hillary, if you leave me here in the dark, I... Come here, Nikki. Look at this sign. A sign? Robert Hayes, magician. Bobby's handiwork. Ah, what's this box? awful mess in there. Yes. Cards, handcuffs, trick coins, wand, handkerchiefs, ropes, huh. collapsible knife, the usual magician's truck. Ah. Oh, don't try to impress me. What's in that packet? Magic hofties? I'm afraid, Nikki, it's a more deadly magic than that. A more deadly... A white powder, Nikki. White powder? Arsenic. Too revolting, Ellery. I wonder why Gordini didn't tell the truth. He knew all the time. Unless... Ellery, a boy. A boy of eight. Well, let's go downstairs, Nikki, and get it over with. How can you know? I've seen everything you have. I've got all the facts. They don't add up to a thing. Bad mathematics, Dad. This... This kid... This Bobby Hayes... The kid? Oh, nuts. I'm in the wrong racket. Ellery, please do it quickly. His poor mother is so upset now. All right, all right. Let's go. We'll all be bawling in a minute. Quiet, please. Quiet, Ellery. Uh, Just a moment, please. Bobby... Bobby, dear. Hey, Mom, what are they going to do now? Why is everybody so quiet? Bobby, I want you to do something for Mother. I want you to go to my bedroom and stay there. Oh, Mom, I want to see. I never saw a real detective get his man. I want to stay. Bobby, please go. Mrs. Hayes. What? Mrs. Hayes, I'd... I'd prefer Bobby to remain here. Remain here? Queen, why don't you let the boy go? This is no place for a child eight years old. And suppose you tell us, Mr. Gordini, who poisoned Sarah Brink. Tell us, and I'll send Bobby away. No! I don't want to go away. Why won't you tell us, Mr. Gordini? Because I've got no proof. You wouldn't believe me. I see. Gordini, when you were on the fire escape... Bobby, you and Mr. Gordini are great pals, I take it. Bobby, be quiet. Oh, Mom. Sure, Mr. Queen, we're just like that. Bobby's at the age, Gordini, when he's most susceptible to the fascinations of secret passages, sliding panels, and... Magic. Right, Gordini? You've been teaching Bobby magic, haven't you? You ought to see all the tricks Mr. Gordini showed me. Bobby, don't say anything. And when Mr. Gordini showed you all these marvelous magic tricks, Bobby, just what did he tell you? That I had to practice all the time. Practicing is the way you get to be a great magician. And uh, Sergeant Feely's revolver, Bobby. My fountain pen. Inspector Queen's snuff box. And, oh, uh, Miss Porter's compact. When you took them from us under our noses, Bobby... You were simply practicing, weren't you? Oh, no, that's that's a... Bobby stole things. 
Oh, Mr. Queen, he couldn't have. He's only a boy. He didn't know what he was doing. I did too, Mom. Only I wasn't stealing them. I left them right in the downstairs hall table, didn't I? That's how I knew it was you, Bobby. I just wanted to see if I could, Mr. Queen. That's not stealing. Bobby. Mommy, I didn't steal. I didn't steal. Hillary, get it over with, will you? And, Bobby, you took that packet of white powder, too, didn't you? White powder? And hid it in your attic hideout. Hmm? I... I... Bobby, don't answer. Let the boy answer, Mrs. Hayes. Please. Bobby? Um, Mr. Gordini told me to look for packages of white powder. Like flour, he said. To take them and give them to him as soon as the coast was clear. But but that one in the attic, I didn't get the chance, Mr. Gordini. I was going to give it to you, but... Bobby, don't say anymore. Why not, Gordini? What is this, Henry? Bobby, what else did Mr. Gordini tell you to do? Nothing. He didn't tell me nothing. Bobby. Bobby, you can tell me. Because I know. You do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. You're a detective. Detectives know everything. But I... I promise not to tell. Well, then suppose I tell you, Bobby, and then it won't be breaking a promise, will it? Hmm. Mr. Gordini told you there was something you had to do to save your mother's life. Isn't that right? She how'd you know that? To save my life, Mr. Queen. And Bobby... My life? You had to do that thing every time there was rabbit stew for lunch or supper, didn't you? Yes, sir. It was something fierce. I had to watch all the time. I had to save my mother's life. I don't know why, but that's what Mr. Gordini told me. No, Bobby, no. And when you couldn't do this certain thing that Mr. Gordini had told you to do, Bobby, when you couldn't do it without your mother and aunt seeing you, you were a very smart boy. You decided to distract their attention. The way magicians do when you don't want them to see their trick. That's yes, right, sir. Bobby, that's right. So last week you purposely let the canary escape. This afternoon you purposely upset the fishbowl. That's right, son. For the love of Pete, why? A diversion, Dad, can only have one purpose, to mask an act. When his mother and aunt were chasing that canary last week, while they were saving the goldfish today, Bobby took the two plates of rabbit stew, his mother's and his aunt's, and switched them. Oh, yeah, that's why. That's what you told Bobby to do every time they had rabbit stew, Gordini, to switch the two women's plates. Because you knew, Gordini, you knew the secret of those rabbits. What secret, Harry? What are you talking about, Maestro? Bobby, will you leave the room now, please? Yes, sir. I don't understand either, Ellery. Dr. Prouty said today that rabbits are immune to arsenic. So if you fed rabbits lettuce or carrots, which had been dosed with the poison, it wouldn't hurt them a bit. But their flesh would become permeated with it. Then, if you made a rabbit stew, you'd be arsenically poisoned. Dad, you found arsenic in the rabbit hutch. That proved the animals were being fed the poison while they were still alive. Then they were slaughtered and cooked into a stew. And yet, only one portion of the stew was poisoned. How is that possible? Who could have controlled the preparation of the stew so rigidly that one portion was cooked with poisoned rabbit and the other with unpoisoned rabbit? Only one person. The person who wouldn't let anyone else feed the rabbits. The person who wouldn't let anyone else prepare food in her kitchen. The cook herself. Sarah. My sister Sarah. Yes, Mrs. Hayes, your sister Sarah. She obviously wasn't trying to poison herself or Bobby, who always refused rabbit stew. She could only have been trying to poison you. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> Gordini, you used to be a chemist. You saw Sarah Brink sprinkle a white powder on the rabbit's food in the hutch one day. You scraped some of it up, analyzed it, saw the whole thing in a flash. And to save Mrs. Hayes' life, you got Bobby to switch plates every time the sisters had rabbit stew. And Bobby did so, never realizing the significance of his act. And so you got Sarah Brink to poison herself. But why, Mr. Queen? Why did my sister want to kill me? I have nothing. Oh, you... You underestimate your wealth, Mrs. Hayes. You have a boy, a son, and all your sister's possessions couldn't buy her that. She wanted Bobby. Yes, Nikki. She wanted Bobby. <laughs> I'm sure that all of you are as happy as I am to learn that Bobby was not the culprit. The first time I heard the play in rehearsal, my money went down on the doctor. But as I said, I'm always wrong about these things. Our performance engaged the talents of three members of the original cast of the Ellery Queen series. Hugh Marlowe, prominent star of the Broadway stage and motion pictures, 
who created the role of Ellery Queen. Santos Ortega as Inspector Richard Queen, and Ted DeCorsia once more in the part of Sergeant Bealey. Nicky was played by Charlotte Keene. Next week, Storm in a Teacup. As a motion picture, Storm in a Teacup was one of those all-too-rare events, uh, a comedy of solid warmth and character, a photoplay about real people. If you join us next week, you will find, I think, that the story has lost none of its warm humor in translation to radio for the first time. Next Sunday, then, you have an appointment to meet Mrs. Honoria Hegarty, her dog Patsy, and the people they stirred into a storm in a teacup. The Adventure of the Bad Boy was written by Ellery Queen. The continuity was by George Faulkner. The original music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Our editor is Howard Teichman, and the entire production was under the direction of George Zachary. The other players heard in today's broadcast were Brad Barker, Harold Durenforth, Sarah Fussell, John Gibson, Averill Harris, Jane Houston, Anne Seymour, Walter Vaughn, and Guy Wallace. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.